Well, welcome everyone and thank you for attending today. We are going to discuss how additive manufacturing has and will continue to be important in the future of automotive manufacturing. Uh, to start off with, I just want to share an experience I had a while ago. I started off my uh, 3D printing experience as a field technician. So I got to go out to all of our customers on a fairly regular basis, keep their machines running, talk to them about the, what they were doing. And I had one customer who made automotive engine parts. And they were always really fun to talk to but they were only using their really, really old Stratasys Dimension printer for prototyping. Well, one day I convinced them to talk to our applications and sales team and see some of the newer ideas at that time that were being used uh, with their 3D printers. So the team came out, they walked around, took a tour of their facility, and got to see everything they were doing, both with their printer and just in general in their facility. Well, as they're walking around the factory floor, they noticed these huge rows of robots, just pick and place robots. And they saw all of the tooling on the end of these arms, all the end effectors were metal. Well, this sparked off the idea for the sales team to suggest, hey, have you guys ever thought of 3D printing any of these? They looked at them like, you can do that? Well, yeah. So with a little bit of uh, guidance, they, were, they talked them through how to redesign some of these shapes for additive manufacturing. And they went from this design you see on the screen that is six different metal machined parts that took three weeks to uh, come full cycle and get back to them if they placed an order, whether something broke or they needed to make a design change, and it cost $1,000 to do each one. With that information, they redesigned the end effector to this design. And instead of taking three weeks, this part printed in eight and a half hours and only cost $80. So what went from taking time away from machines that could be making product and took weeks to accomplish became an overnight process that they could handle with their 3D printer just in the design team. They didn't have to go to the production team at all. Then this allowed them to then re-outfit their entire bank of 70 robots instead of what would take four years of machining time down to 35 days of 3D printing and save them over $54,000. So this really made a big difference to them and they saw the benefits of this really quickly and I still remember seeing when my team pulled this part off of our printer and were able to realize the new use for their printer that they had just been doing prototypes before and it was so mind-blowing to them that they totally justified buying a bigger printer just to do this project. It was such a fun project to see. Anyway, I'm Joseph, uh, an application engineer out of the Atlanta, Georgia area. I've been working with Stratasys 3D printers now for 14 years, going from uh, field service now into application engineering, and I just love it. Uh, when I'm not 3D printing, I'm painting little miniatures or reading or hanging out with my family. And I'd like to introduce Jonathan, my wonderful co-host. Hey, everybody. Uh, again, welcome to our webinar. My name's Jonathan. I am also an application engineer on the additive manufacturing team at Go Engineer. I've been working with Stratasys printers for about six years now, and I'm actually out of the Ambler, Pennsylvania office. Um, when I am not watching Eagles games, I tend to also watch the Sixers lose some games. I'm an avid gamer, uh, and it's been a blast uh, being on the application engineering team, as Joseph had mentioned. I also want to introduce Fadi from Stratasys. He was kind enough to join us. Uh, 
huge shout out to him. He's the global director of transportation at Stratasys. I know Fadi likes to say if uh, if it has any wheels and it's not flying, that's his purview. Do you want to say anything, Fadi? <laughs> yeah, no, thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Joseph, for including me. I'm happy to be around, look at these wonderful applications, and certainly answer any questions from anyone in the chat. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I've been uh, at Stratasys for 13 years. Um, have been mostly focused on automotive uh, in my various roles from engineering to sales. I used to work at a tier one supplier prior to that um, in automotive. Um, so a lot of experience around the automotive and additive space. And I'm happy to see what you guys are doing here today and participate in any way I can. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. All right, Joseph, next slide. So who are we at Go Engineer? Well, Go Engineer delivers software, technology, and expertise that enable companies to unlock design innovation. We've been in the industry for more than 35 years with thousands of customers, especially with a focus on uh, automotive for this presentation. Uh, but just wanna highlight, we have a YouTube channel if you wanna hear any more about these products, self-paced uh, training, and our online customer portal. So we have over 60 offices nationwide. Uh, this is something that's going to be weaved through this presentation. If you reach out to us, you're always going to have somebody nearby you and uh, tons of experience, a wealth of knowledge. So a really great team that we have and, and a great team that we want to use to, to help you out. We have over 200 technical resources that are fully certified in SolidWorks and Stratasys. So our purpose for this presentation and just in general is to empower the creation of today's products and tomorrow's innovations. And again, that's gonna be weaved through this presentation and through everything that we do. Who is Stratasys? I'm going to try to do my best on this one. Uh, so they've also been in the industry over 30 years, trusted by many top automotive manufacturers and not only just top automotive fact, uh, manufacturers like your Fords, but also smaller companies. They're regularly innovating, regularly pushing what's possible. And then one thing I wanted to highlight for this presentation is it's not just fused deposition or extrusion, extrusion printing anymore. Stratasys uh, was most known for Polyjet and their fused deposition modeling or extrusion printing with their Polyjet lineup and their FDM, the F123 series, the Ford is 450, et cetera. But now also uh, a new range of technologies that are being incorporated. So stereolithography with the Neo products, the H350 powder bed system, SAF uh, and P3. So many different applications, many different use cases, but just think, there's something for everybody. Uh, there's the prototyping, there's the end use parts, there's small production runs, even uh, teetering towards the medium sized production runs. And then of course, a broad material uh, lineup for many of these products. So reach out to us, let us know if you have a certain project and we'll be able to help you find something. In order to know where we're going in automotive, we have to talk a bit about where we have been and, and where we've seen our successes. So the success number one that I wanted to highlight was general tooling. Joseph started with a great story about a customer that he was working with as a field service uh, tech and then also with the sales team, et cetera, about these end of arm tools. So you have a lot of design flexibility with additive manufacturing. You have many material options, like I've mentioned, especially with some of the composites that are starting to be rolled out. So you can really optimize your designs, reduce weight and save on cost and time in the long run. The first customer I wanted to start with and highlight was Rutland Plastics. Uh, they have this end of arm tool. They were bulky tools. They had a lengthy post-processing time for each part and they had really complex geometries and so what they saw with additive manufacturing was uh, in addition to being able to print some complex geometries and simplify their parts there were also composite materials that were starting to be rolled out that really uh, made a good substitute for the metals that they were using and they found cost reduction with that similarly in addition to uh, the weight savings. So as an avid BMW fan, this one I really, really enjoy. Their direct digital manufacturing uh, team had this assembly tool. They had challenges with the handling and ergonomics of it. It was a heavier part. The lead times to make it held them back a bit. And then of course, weight. So what they found with additive manufacturing was that they were able to 3D print these assembly tools. Some of these composite materials were strong enough to be a good analogous uh, material. And then they were able to simplify the design, reduce the weight, and also design it for the user. So you could have custom tools that really felt uh, fit the user a lot better than just making one part for everybody. 
And then on the bottom, you can see that they were able to reduce the lead times by about 16 days and the cost savings about $244 per part. One of the ones that people have done with the soluble supports on FDM, and then also, of course, some of the newer materials that you can use for sacrificial tooling, being able to create complex or hollow structures that can be dissolved, can be burned out, easily removable, and they're durable. Some of these materials can be autoclaved. Down here, you can see some photos of a carbon fiber layup. So you can create some really complex geometries for your parts that are a little bit more difficult to create typical molds for. So here's an actual application of that. This is Wolfpack Motorsports. It's a competition team. They were struggling with having enough design iterations to get the perfect part for them and for their race car. They had trouble with lead times and both of those combined with tight competition deadlines meant that they could only get a few of these out each time, each design cycle before the competition. So they were really looking for a solution to have more iterations to test more designs and get something that better suited their application. And what they found was they were actually able to create these soluble molds that could be dissolved out after they created their layups. They had greater design freedom and they were actually able to have about 16 times more design iterations uh, according to their estimates. So really huge savings for them, especially when you're talking about tight competition deadlines, getting to market quicker. So like Joseph, I also have a, a personal project that uh, has had a big impact on me lately. I have a friend that bought this decommissioned USPS Jeep off of auction. It's a right-hand drive model. It's, I think uh, the VIN number is a 2008 model, but again, decommissioned. And this AC vent cover that they had is completely destroyed. So. Uh, next slide, you can actually see pictures of what it looks like when they took it off. I won't ask him how careful he was taking it off or if he decided a hammer was the best approach to remove it, but that's how it came to me. And with a bit of coffee, some late nights, I was able to 3D scan, reverse engineer this, and actually 3D print it on the Stratasys H350. I haven't been able to mount it on the car yet. I'm excited to try it. This is the gray that it looks like coming off the printer, but we have some dyeing options. And so one of the other successes was, Joseph alluded to thinking about 3D printing as just for functional prototypes or prototyping. But now we have the materials, the accuracy, the, the durability of parts to have some end used parts. Uh, so specifically, I'm hoping that this AC vent cover works great for him. Again, hoping to put some primer on it, paint it, and see if we can get it mounted on the truck. And then maybe, just maybe, he'll let me borrow it. And then that's up to you, Joseph. All right, thank you, Jonathan, that was great. Now, those are some of the, our, our, uh, the things Stratasys printers have been used for in the past, and very successfully, We've done very, very well. And I like to look towards the future, and so does the Center for Automotive Research. They have said, given its advantages, and the continuous improvements made in the industry, additive manufacturing is expected to become increasingly relevant in transforming the automotive industry's production processes and products. So even uh, research groups are seeing this potential. And a lot of groups see it every day. Biggest strength for additive manufacturing in the automotive industry is its agility. Its ability to react to emerging trends and emerging needs. It's a very versatile tool with very uh, with wide range of materials that can address some of the future needs, even questions and problems we haven't come, come across yet. Uh, there are things like all the electric vehicles that are coming out and the the emissions regulations that uh, are being proposed in Congress even now. These are things that additive manufacturing can help automotive industry react to more quickly and keep up with all of these new hurdles and challenges they would have to come across. Then there's also the speed the story I told at the beginning. They went from three weeks out 
on getting parts they requested to an overnight scenario, those are things that can make a huge difference to anyone's results and bottom line. Assembly manufacturers, tooling, and just all sorts of applications that have been successful and can continue to grow. Uh, the second is bringing additive manufacturing on site for manufacturing purposes. Things like surrogate parts, they can be used for training uh, new processes, new products, even before you actually get the, the true physical model in-house, you can begin using surrogate parts to get the ball rolling and get a leg up on the next stage. Very complex geometries. One of the greatest things about additive manufacturing is you kind of get complexity for free. There, it really doesn't add a whole lot. Whereas injection molding, if you have to have multiple uh, pieces to your mold, the cost of that goes up exponentially. Well, with 3D printing, you can just get all of that with the same tool. Uh, you can now do low to medium production runs with some of the newer technologies, and we'll go through a, a quick example of that here in a minute. There are also newer composite materials that can, in some cases, replace metals. Not in all cases, of course, but new ideas for lighter weight components with these composite materials are now possible. And also lower cost per part. In many cases, some of these uh, molds uh, get very complex and very expensive where you can just print something for a fraction of the cost. Let's go through one of those examples. I had a customer a few years back who was working uh, in a university doing some research work and he was just using a little PLA only printer. Well, that material wasn't holding up to the heat of the interior of the cars. And he got a Stratasys printer, started printing an ABS, and he told me it was like a night and day difference, just going to ABS where it would stand the heat of the interior of the car. And that's just stuck with me. So in remembering of that experience, I designed this little door lock, kind of modeled off of my little Toyota, and used it as this example for small volume uh, production. On the H350, the SAF printer, it's the powder bed and nylon printer, we could run 525 parts in a little over 12 hours. This is using the nylon 11 material and at a cost of just a little over a dollar each. The two to three days part is including the post-processing and even optional dyeing of the uh, parts if you would desire, dyeing almost any color. So very quickly you can get a lot of these little semi-complex parts, possibly for a lot less than traditional manufacturing. Another option would be on the Origin 1, the DLP system. This uh, example is using the Dura 56 material, a very strong a relatively high temperature material, certainly enough for a car interior, uh, can also print in a little over 12 hours and costs well under a dollar per part. The two days here is also referencing the full time of processing the parts after printing uh, to give a realistic expectation for that. Uh, both of these examples show the possibility of doing low run manufacturing on site, on your factory floor. And that's leading into my next point. Of, hey, Tristan. Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, uh, but I just wanna, if you can go back one slide or uh -huh. to the, the, the example there. I just wanna hammer the point because I think sometimes people don't quite understand the kind of volumes we're talking about. We're talking about 500 and essentially half a day, if a day is yeah. 24 hours, right? So we're talking about Let's just say you can get 10 builds a week. Maybe that's one build on Saturday. Just if you push right. everything to the limit, right? So that's on origin uh, on the DLP side or powder on the SAF side. You're talking about 5,000 units or so a week. Yeah. Yeah. So if he, that, that's 5,000 a week, you know, times 52 weeks, 
uh, I don't know, do the math, 280, whatever that is. Um, so you can get these huge numbers if the economics are right. right. Well, let's say the economics aren't right. Let's just say 70 cents or 79 cents is not what we need to be economically sound for this part in the 200,000 range. Now, what we're saying is the machine can do 200,000 annually, a single machine, two machines could do double that, but a single machine can do the volumes, but maybe it's not economically sound. But you need the 5,000 today. Right. You need the 5,000 this week. Your production parts are coming from China. I just saw the, the next images of a ship caught, <laughs> caught yeah. in transit, right? So you could presumably meet your demand weekly, monthly, for as long as you need to and have that agility um, as long as you need to and then still switch to your traditional production solution. But Correct. I just want to remember the point that we're talking about 5,000 a week here. I mean, 512 hours sometimes is not as concrete as 5,000 a week, right? Sure, right. Yeah, thanks, Fadi. Uh, so just to continue that one is our supply chain issues. This is still recent enough that it it still hurts sometimes, right? This is I love this image of the ship caught in the Suez Canal. Uh, all of those people are waiting for everything on that tanker for way longer than they expected. Now, it doesn't even take disasters like this. It, just a, a standard storm can slow a ship down. Uh, there can even be political climates that cause delays in in shipping so you can sometimes create your own uh, factory in-house but as Fadi was saying even just to alleviate the strain on a delayed delivery that can be very very important uh, reduce shipping costs by not having to ship things just support your local factory needs whether it be tooling or uh, an ergonomic fix, all of those things that, that were mentioned before. But probably most important is to protect that intellectual property. When you're sending things overseas, whatever contracts you might have in place, you don't always know exactly what's happening, right? When you give um, some other company your intellectual property to produce it. So protecting that into intellectual property and reducing all of these supply issues by itself can be a very important cost saver for your companies. So, Jonathan, if you want to recap it for us. Absolutely. Uh, so to Fadi's point and to what Joseph had mentioned, additive manufacturing as a supplementary tool, so not replacing traditional manufacturing but working hand in hand, can give you the ability to react quickly and also insulate you a bit to some of those disruptions. Uh, everybody experienced a lot of the disruptions with the weather conditions lately and the different things going on. So giving some insulation where you can pivot either way, whether it's a situation where you have to machine a part because that's what's available in your shop or you have to 3D print it because you're waiting for an injection mold from another shop or, or whatever it may be. So as a supplementary tool, it can give you the ability to react quickly and insulate you a bit towards design changes and disruptions. If metals aren't required, like some of the applications we talked about, there might be a composite that can slot right in and, and work perfectly for you, whether it's from a weight savings, or being able to create really complex parts that machining it would be very difficult, but 3D printing with soluble supports, we don't think about too often. So those are different options for you. But one thing I really wanna harp on, if you remember one thing that Jonathan has said, is that it's not a magic wand. Additive manufacturing does not do everything perfectly all the time, as Fadi has mentioned, uh, 79 cents a part doesn't look great economically if you're talking tens of thousands of parts, but if you need to get by with 500 or 5,000 for the week or whatever it may be until your mold comes in or however you were planning the process in the beginning, then that may be a solution for you. It gives you that flexibility. Leveraging that lights off solution, so printing overnight without operator interruption or anything like that. Going back a few years, I, I remember in my previous role, 
we were 3D printing parts and when offices started saying, hey, we're allowing people back, but in limited numbers to make sure that everybody was safe and properly distanced, it was great to be able to send a part to the 3D printer and not think about it. And whoever was in the office could walk over, press print, and then when I came in the next time, I could take it right off and continue on with my day. So leveraging the fact that it could go on overnight without a lot of intervention. And then many on uh, automation processes. So being, again, able to connect to it in the cloud, being able to queue up multiple builds, things like that. I want to give you a checklist. Uh, if you can walk away with, let's say you remember a 1B thing that Jonathan has said. So just a really quick thing. If you can analyze your current processes or your current parts, identify any pain points or large complex assemblies like Joseph's uh, end of arm tool that he had mentioned in the very beginning, things that have long lead times and can be cumbersome to produce. If there are parts that you need a few of, let's say, you know, that 500 that we had mentioned on the origin instead of the thousands. But if you were to order or create an injection mold for it, there's that that cutoff where you have to produce enough for it to pay itself off. Then this might be an option for you. Validate the technology. So again, it's not a one size fits all. One technology is going to do something better than other technologies, and they're not going to solve all of the issues. But if there is a problem part that you could think of and we can come up with a technology that might solve it and a material that might solve it and a throughput that makes sense, then this may be a good option for you. And then ultimately, from a business standpoint, is it validated? Is it saving you enough time? Is it saving you enough money? Is it offering enough of a disruption proof that you say, we really need this in our shop? especially from an operator perspective, is it is it justifiable to you that you have this additional product that can assist with your current workflow? Just to expand everything I said in a screenshotable image uh, that I am also willing to share, this might give you something to think about. If you want to take a moment to screenshot this, if you want to say anything in the question section about it, whatever it may be. Again, I just tried to put something together that was straightforward, clear, and concise that you can maybe take away with you, think about, and say, you know what, maybe there is that that part that for one reason or another makes sense and we should explore. I mentioned very quickly in the beginning, we've been in the industry for over 30 years. Stratasys has been in the industry over 30 years. We have application engineers all along, uh, all the way across the country, you know, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., tons of experience. So if you could go back to your shop and just do this part, if you could analyze your current process, identify one part that is causing you trouble or one process that is causing you trouble, then reach out and we can help you with the rest of the process. That's what we're here for. We want to be partners with your company. So this is a very, again, snippet of the checklist that if you find that one part or that one process that is causing you headache, reach out and we can see how we can help you. All right, Joseph, you're up. Thank you, Jonathan. So just to tie this all back together, we would love for you to be our next amazing story that we can share with, with others. Um, how my, my customer friends here went from three weeks of lead time and a thousand dollars just to change out one robot down to being able to change all 70 out in less than a month and for a fraction of that cost we would love for you to be these next stories so as jonathan invited you i want to invite again Think about your processes. Is there something different that can be done? And reach out to us at Go Engineer. We'd love to help you develop this application and get you this type of success. All right, we'd love to open it up to any questions you may have. I see one that includes some math. Oh boy, wow, 5,000 a week, that's 260,000 a year. So talking about the not magic wand, if you're doing 260,000 a year, you need it. We we should definitely explore different options. Uh, but yes, you could have that throughput if, if you just decided, hey, we want to 3D print these. I am excited to receive that AC vent cover for from the H350. It's in the mail right now. UPS is great about telling me by end of day and they do it right at the end of the day. So I still have about another hour on the East Coast before I get to see them in person. But 
parts coming off the H350 are absolutely incredible. Any questions from our customers? Anybody joining us want to comment? Anything like that? Fadi, what did you think? Did we miss anything? <laughs> no, I think it all makes sense. Um, you guys do a great job as always. Um, you know, as Stratasys, we work through a distributorship model. Uh, companies like Go Engineer are our boots on the ground. They're the ones connecting with you customers and engaging with you on these exact applications, uh, giving us feedback, getting us involved when it makes sense. Um, so it's a really good partnership. And obviously, you guys, uh, you guys know where our technology fits, and that's why you're repping it, which you know we obviously appreciate. Um, I will say the one thing that sometimes it can get a little confusing is the tooling, is it this, is it that? 3D printing and automotive fits in three categories. Product development, production support, which is I think some of the tooling examples you saw, like how, what the, the story that Joseph started with, that's production support. You're supporting the production of the vehicle. Uh, and then of course, production. So those are the three columns in which you're typically thinking, am I developing a product? Is this a prototype? Is this a product development need? Is it a tooling need um, or a product production support need, um, or is it a production part? Those are kind of the three categories. I would just urge you to at least whittle yourself down as you're thinking through of how I'm going to implement additive. In some small shops, it's all three. Hey, I need a prototype. Hey, I need a jig. Hey, I need a part. Um, that all makes sense. Um, uh, but for the most part, uh, you want to figure out how you're going to justify this equipment, how you're going to bring it in, what's the business case. Um, you know, we play on the industrial space. We don't, we're not a hobby level type company. Uh, we, and we want you to buy industrial equipment. You wouldn't buy um, a Dremel to create a CNC part. You would use a CNC to make a CNC part. Um, so we are in the industrial space. We're not in the hobby level space. Uh, and sometimes it requires justification, understand the applications, figuring out where you fit in those three categories. Absolutely. Very well said. Uh, so one question that came in was actually, what role does material science play in additive manufacturing for automotive applications? And then a second part to it, are there any specific materials that are well suited for additive manufacturing in this context, automotive? So um, it is a long answer, but I will just boil it down to the, to the nitty gritty, and then we can, of course, take it offline. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think of my three pillars or categories in product development, material is not that critical. It's like it's got a short life. I need to print it, look at it, make sure my design was good. Maybe put it on the car. Uh, is there a, you know, is there a design crash that I didn't see in data? Is it going to perform in the wind tunnel model? Okay, the wind tunnel model is done. Throw this thing in the trash. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a short life cycle in the product development side. So material is not super critical. Um, it can be. Uh, stiffness, color, those kinds of things, but they're traditionally not super critical. Um, for the tooling bucket, what's incredibly critical there is stiffness, and I think you alluded to this, uh, John. Um, <clears throat> you want something that has a high stiffness to weight ratio. So the composite materials like nylon 12 carbon fiber, uh, both at a 10% 10, 10 fill on the 370s and the, 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 the more economical printers, and then the nylon 12 CF, which is about 35% fill on the more industrial printers. That material is amazing because it gives you uh, the ability to substitute alloys, as you guys were talking about, because it's so incredibly stiff and incredibly strong. It's five times stiffer than Ultem, which has always been our kind of super plastic. It's 5x the stiffness of that. So I would say uh, when it comes to material chemistry, um, you want to look for composites on the tooling side. Uh, that are reinforced plastics uh, to give you the stiffness. And then on the production side, it's so um, component driven. Uh, is it an exterior component, interior component, exposed to UV, not exposed to UV? Is it clear? Is it um, leather wrapped? Is it textured? There's a lot of uh, different requirements, but um, we are constantly uh, in development for those kind of production applications. So um, the heat vent that you um, uh, uh, the AC vent that you talk about, um, that is a nylon 11 material. That is a true production nylon, so it's going to perform the same way that an automotive um, injection molded nylon is going to perform for the most part. And then um, in certain things where uh, UV exposure is a concern, and we're talking about a UV exposed material that comes out of a resin-based system, we actually have new materials coming out all the time that are more UV resistant or uh, have, have all this aging testing behind it. 
um, on the thermoset side, on the thermoplastic side, those materials are already inherently uh, UV stable and strong and all that. Yeah, great summary of it. I, I will also add um, one of the materials I'd alluded to are the soluble materials. Specifically, the example I used was QSR. Uh, it's one of the uh, dissolvable support materials that we use, but there's other materials that are specifically tailored towards autoclaving, so using for carbon fiber layups. So it has to be able to withstand the temperature, the pressure, et cetera. So there is a material tailored to that. Uh, there are materials that are tailored towards wind tunnel testing. So we're as Fadi had mentioned, there's a ton of them, too many to go through in this context, but certainly if there's an application you have in mind, reach out and we can uh, answer that more appropriately for you. And there's a ton of material science that goes into it. So we have a, a lot of uh, different people that are, are seeing applications and saying, how do we create a material for this specific thing? And then that's what we make sure that the customers learn about. We're, we're almost always working backwards from your application or your uh, pain points. Um, if you're listening to this or watching this later, we're working from your pain points and your application um, because the the choices start to get overwhelming. If you just want to know everything that everybody can do, um, I mean, sort of like walking into an airport and saying, show me every flight out of Detroit. You would not do that. You'd say, okay, I'm trying to get to Minneapolis. What are my best ways to get from Detroit to Minneapolis? Oh, I got to connect through Chicago or I can take a direct flight or whatever. Uh, and, and you'll see those options. Um, so don't... Um, you know, to do your best to figure out where, where it is um, that you want to play, which I think was one of the, the brilliant slides that uh, Jonathan showed. Absolutely. And then as far, the next one was, are there any specific automotive components or parts that are better suited for additive manufacturing compared to traditional manufacturing processes? If so, why? So one of the things I want to quickly highlight, Joseph had mentioned, with additive manufacturing, complexity tends to come cheaply or free-ish. And what I mean by that is with the soluble supports, I can create some really weird channels that machining would be very difficult or injection molding would be very difficult because of undercuts or, or different complexities. So complexity comes very cheaply. Um, if it's low to medium volumes, that tends to work well also, like Fadi mentioned, at 79 cents a part, if you're talking 5,000, you're like, I, I've gotten through that pain point, I've made it through the work week, we've gotten those parts out. But if you're talking tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, then it becomes a, a more difficult challenge. And I actually, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I had this question for Fadi, but if Joseph, you can switch to the next slide. So this is specifically one that is like that. Uh, they had a last minute design change. This is Roush Performance, so we're not talking hundreds of thousands of cars. Uh, it's, it's a performance package, so we're talking, I mean, Fadi, how, how many cars were they looking to, or how about many? 50, about 50 a week, uh, and they pretty much run all year, so you know, you're in the 2,000-ish range. Okay, so so sub 5,000 on this uh, on these vehicles and also this camera mount. So this is something uh, as well that we could have injection molded this part, uh, but in this case the volumes were low and a last minute design change kind of forced them to say, okay, we can no longer do this traditionally. We have to have some flexibility and maybe consider additive manufacturing. So Fadi, would you like to talk about this this one specifically with respect to that question? Yeah, I'll just answer the heart of the question first to um, what components make sense for automotive production. It's typically going to be a high value, low volume curve that you have to think about. So is there a high value component, meaning it's not a flat plate with two holes in it, right? It's some complex shape as Jonathan was just talking about. And then secondly is, are the volumes within a space that um, you can mass produce these in 3D printing or you know, not maybe mass producers are on word. You can make a lot of batches in 3D printing at a reasonable price. So sometimes that's small. I can get a small component and make a bunch of them, like the example that you saw from Joseph. Uh, in this example, this part isn't really isn't that small. I mean, this part you can fit about 42 of them in a um, single build for our H350. Um, so you're talking about, um, you know, in 10 hours you have nearly your entire week's. Um, uh, production rate. Remember, they want 50 a week. So that's a build and a half, a build, or you can do two half builds or two three-quarter builds. And then um, you end up with all the parts that you need. 
So in this case, it was all about the time needed and the fact that the cost was not more than injection molding. So they needed the parts right away. They already have trucks lined up, ready to go. It turns out the camera mount was kind of positioned incorrectly and they needed to fix the mount uh, and the cover. And so they did that in 3D printing to test it. And then they were like, hey, is this stuff strong enough to, to do? So they did durability testing. They did a PPAP with us. Um, we went through all the production kind of standards that we would need to go through. They did the math and they said, yeah, you know what? It would take us a couple of years before it makes sense for the injection, the cost of the initial tool the initial injection mold. So why aren't why aren't we switch to this? And in a couple of years, we're likely going to have design changes to this, or it's going to be a completely different grill. So at this point, we'd rather just um, stick with the printed technology uh, and the production parts that way. Yeah, well said. Uh, the other question that came in was, apart from polymers, what other materials do you use for printing? So I would say on the Stratus. Stratasys lineup currently, it is polymers. Um, there are other materials that can be printed with. There are metal printers out there. There's different technologies. Uh, in Go Engineer, we do have some products that are specifically tailored towards metal, but all of the ones we kind of highlighted today were, were polymer. Yeah, polymers has been around for 30 years. Um, so we have a little bit of a head start and additive in terms of where polymer performance is, perform accuracy, cost per part, um, repeatability, all the things that people care about to make components. We've sort of had the pain <laughs> of growing through that and developing it and making it 100% um, where it needs to be. On the metal side, um, you're still in a world where if it's cheaper to machine it, you should just machine it. So um, that's just something to consider um, as you go through that. Now, there are times where you can't machine a component or the timing is so tight that it's better to build it. Um, and the folks at Go Engineer rep a few other um, companies that are uh, uh, deploying different metal technologies for creating 3D printed parts. If you have any other questions, please throw them in the chat. Uh, Joseph, if you could switch to the next slide. I, I actually had a question that I had ready for Fadi because I like things that go fast uh, and race cars tend to do that quite often. This is actually Radford Motors. Uh, Pikes Peak International Hill Climb was end of June, I believe, and they found some success with especially 3D printing. So, Fadi, I guess just generally speaking, how did additive manufacturing play a role in, I guess, coming first in their class and then eighth overall fastest? So, <laughs> Does that thing look like it can go fast? I don't know. I, <laughs> I, think the, I think it could use more arrow for sure. I think definitely another spoiler, um, <laughs> a few more head scoops. That thing is beautiful. Um, so first off, let me just talk about Pikes Peak in case you're not familiar with it. Um, I think it's a 12 mile curvy uphill climb, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, and these cars do it. I mean, when I say curvy, I'm talking about like giant. I mean, it's basically a circle at some point. Um, and, <clears throat> and cars, these cars are doing it in, I think, 10 minutes, um, uphill, uh, 12 miles, curvy off the edge of a cliff and a rocket. It's just crazy. <laughs> Definitely so, not for amateurs. Yeah, no, I don't know that I would even drive it in my normal car. <laughs> so, um, look, uh, we have a relationship with this company, Radford Motors. Um, what they did about, uh, I think maybe just before the pandemic started in, in late 2019, they started building um, these custom kind of lotuses. They got the rights to build lotuses, and they were going to make 62 limited run lotuses um, that were just, you know, consumer products that a consumer, anybody who has that much money can go buy one. Um, and they made 62 of them. Uh, they leveraged 3D printing. There's a great video out there. Um, if you type in Radford and Stratasys, you'll see the video of kind of how we came together on this on the short run vehicle project. There was about 200 printed parts on the cars, um, really custom stuff, really complicated stuff. They leather wrapped a lot of the 3D prints. They didn't even have to do any finishing, like just print, leather wrap, put it on the car. Uh, really beautiful, beautiful stuff. Um, and so we have a relationship with them, and they decided to create a version of this supercar that they were making 
that was specifically designed for um, this um, uh, this particular uh, race. And so the cool thing about it is that we basically took a custom high-end vehicle that had a bunch of our parts on it and then customized it even further. And of course, that required more 3D printing um, solutions and ducting and um, and elements, weight, uh, you know, uh, lightening the weight in certain areas, creating lattice structures, creating ducts, um, taking things out, putting things in. So we already had an established relationship with them and, and they used us. I think this particular car ended up with 70 more 3D printed parts on it than the original car um, and including some stuff that isn't on the car that was used to produce the vehicle, um, like carbon fiber and layup tools, some of the sacrificial tooling stuff that you showed earlier as well. Yeah, I mean, if if I had enough money to buy this, for sure, I think I got to go to the grocery store in it. Definitely, at least once. Just yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, I think I'd find somewhere a little bit cooler than the grocery store to go. I'm just just advice. Once once you get the money. <laughs> well, I think trying to find out where to store your groceries in this uh, <laughs> would be like the best part. You're just in the parking lot, just trying to fit it in there. It'll be in your <laughs> I, lap. Yeah, I, I think the the dramatic is always the most fun for me. <clears throat> so it looks like we don't have any other questions. Uh, if you have anything, please let us know right now or certainly reach out to us. Uh, also, Joseph is going to kind of close us out. And I don't have any more questions for you, Fadi. I don't know uh, if, if anybody else wanted to say something. Joseph, if you had any questions. I'll just I think say we that, covered it. Yeah, Fadi? Uh, yeah, I'll just say that, you know, Stratus and Go Engineer are here to help. Uh, uh, you know, you'll have the contact information from the webinar and all that. For the folks at Go Engineer, and and uh, you can always reach out to me directly and uh, find me on LinkedIn or wherever. So happy to help and talk talk automotive and talk additive anytime. Very good. Well, thank you all for participating and watching today, and Fadi for joining us, of course. And please reach out to us at Go Engineer with any questions you may have. Have a good day. All right. Thank you, everyone.